Yeah, if you can only get to a person, so on that one. So, all right. Well, let's start. Let's pray, and then we'll uh, we'll get into God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to go through your word and see how your word, Lord, uh, measures up with all these other uh, false religions. And Lord, and uh, when it comes down to it, actually, it's not even the fact of you know your word having to measure up. It's, it's the false religions that are trying to catch up, and they're never going to. Lord, we thank you that you are a great and powerful and mighty God, and we ask that tonight that you would show us your truth through your word. In Jesus' name, guide us into all truth. Amen. Last week we talked about Catholicism in light of the Bible. We're going to do part two this week. We had a lot of people that were asking, you know, for, for other questions, and it's amazing how much you, when you find out, you go, well, how, did, how is that possible, or why would a person believe that, or why would they do that, or you know, like we talked about Islam, they're like, you know, what kind of people would actually believe that? Well, if you're like myself, you know, as far as Catholicism, that's what I, was, I grew up in. That's, all I only, that's the only thing I ever knew. So same thing like with Islam and all those different things. You know, it's, it's a matter of, a lot of you know, for a lot of them, it's a matter of, you know, the fact that you grew up in it. With Islam, it's more, you know, it could also go along the lines of that they say either you believe or we kill you. Um, Catholicism is not quite like that. Um, I haven't seen, I haven't heard of a, you know, besides, and this is one of the things that, um, I don't know if I brought up last week, but when somebody brings up to you, say, you know what, I don't want to ever be a Christian because, you know what, the Crusades. And I believe that, you know, if I did say it last week, it's the fact of, you know, you could say it right there, because you say, whoa, stop right there. The Crusades were started by the Catholics. Christians did not even participate in that. The Catholics are the ones that started going after everybody else and started saying, if you don't believe, well, kind of along the lines that, you know, that the Muslims did, you know, you know, with different things when they call it jihad on something, you know, they said, if you don't believe, then we're going to kill you. You know, if you don't believe like us, if you don't want to go, go about those things. But um, this morning, I mean, this evening, as we look at it, last week I told you that, you know, somebody asked a the question, they said, why do they call a priest's father? And they're not supposed to. Well, you know, we see in Matthew chapter 23, verse 9, it says, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. And so that's something that, you know, right away that they go about and they say, you know what, this is what we're going to, you know, the priest is called father. Well, no, you're not supposed to call anybody but father, but your heavenly father, right? And so that was one of the uh, other parts. Tonight, actually, what we're going to look at, we're going to look at how Catholicism and other religions actually kind of mix together. One of the religions, one of the main religions that actually mixes really well with Catholicism, with Catholics, is Buddhism. You say, well, how is that possible? You know, I have never seen a priest going around with a shaved head and all sort of stuff. Well, well, for first of all, both Catholics and Buddhists have monks, they have nuns, they have monasteries, they go on pilgrimages, and uh, you know, to shrines where they uh, where there are relics of saints and corpses, corpses of saints that they want. Uh, want to just touch the hem of the garment of some dead body in order to get some kind of blessing. They all believe that. Those two, you know, they will go, I mean, during the you know, Middle Ages and even now, uh, you'll have it in other countries a lot more than you'll have it uh, here as far as I know. Uh, there's a lot of times where they're selling relics, they're selling things like, um, for a while, they said after like the third century that they dug up and they said, this is the cross of Christ. And they started to gold plate the cross of Christ, like the little slivers off of it, and selling it. And then the people, what they would do is that whatever kind of relic they have, they would like wear it around their neck because that's supposed to ward off evil. There's a lot of those things that they will do as far as, you know, if you have a patron saint, I see people wear little patron saints around because that's supposed to protect them from evil. I mean, all these different ones, they'll go around wearing these little pendants and everything else that will say these things. But just so we know, then also the, the fact of um, you know, Mary, there, there's no mention of the papacy or the uh, pope in the Bible. There's never, you know, a mention of that at all. They'll say Peter was the first pope. No, he wasn't. The worship and adoration of Mary or the immaculate conception or the, perpe uh, the perpetual virginity of Mary. What does that word mean, per uh, perpetual? She's always been a virgin. Even after the birth of Christ, she was always a virgin. She never had any kids, even though the Bible says contrary to it. The assumption of, of Mary or Mary as co-redemptrix. When I mean that, co-redemptrix is the fact that she's now a part of the Trinity. That they say that she is 
uh, that she, uh, you know, that she petitioned, you know, she, she's able to partition, uh, partition or petition, sorry, um, on behalf of your prayers. You cannot pray to God, you know, you cannot pray to God on your own. You need, you need a saint to bring that prayer to God. But they fail to you know, recognize the verse that says, but there is one mediator between God and man, and that is man, Christ Jesus. And so when we look at it, you know, the saints are supposed to uh, you know, petition, you know, uh, sorry, Catholics are supposed to petition heaven for their prayers, so that way one of those will get delivered to Jesus because you're not supposed to talk to him directly according to them. There's you know, nothing about apostolic succession, saying that basically all these popes have been all lined up and they just keep on going on. The ordinances of the church functioning as sacraments, the Bible never talks about, about sacraments and, or you having to take them or the fact that if you don't take them, you're not saved. They'll teach that. Infant baptism, they'll te- you know, teach that you've got to baptize uh, you know, your baby in order to get rid of original sin. Like I said before, I had family members, you know, I talked about this last week, that I had family members that when I didn't baptize my daughter when she was two months old, three months old, four, I mean, they're just like, what are you doing? You're supposed to baptize her. You know, she dies, she's going to go to hell. I mean, just, that's her thing because in their mind, it's original sin. If she has sin on her, that she's going to go to hell. And, uh, you know, I need to remind you that, you know, the Bible talks about, you know, babies are um, born innocent, that they don't have sin. They, they, don't even, they don't even know what sin is. They don't have no idea right and wrong. The Bible talks about the fact of somebody getting baptized when they did what? When they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. When they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Bible says, then you get baptized. It's a believer's baptism, but also, when are you supposed to get baptized? You know, sorry, when are you supposed to, uh, when supposedly can you go to hell? That would be when you are able to know right from wrong. You know that this is a sin, this is not. You're able to judge those things. That's why, you know, uh, a lot of churches refer to it as the age of accountability. Because that's basically what, you know, that's what the Bible teaches. They talk about, you know, confessing your sin to a priest. But the Bible says that he is faithful and just to forgive all sin. You don't have to go to a priest. He says you can confess your sin to one to another, but that doesn't mean that all of a sudden, like, if I go over to Doug and say, hey, Doug, I've been, you know, I have this sin or whatever, can, you know, and then Doug comes back and says, hey, you know, do like 15 Hail Marys. No, what I'm confessing to him is so he can pray, you know, for me and pray with me, Right? They also believe in purgatory. Purgatory is, you know, there's heaven, you know, to them, there's heaven, hell, and purgatory. Purgatory is if, like, you didn't get in there on, on, you know, your own, you know, on your own as far as, you know, faith alone. Oh, you can go to purgatory, you know, have torment, you know, and burned and everything else. That kind of sounds like hell. And then once you've, you know, once you've appeased everything, then God's going to take you up into heaven. Once God's already taken care of all your sin and all those things, that's what, you know, that at that point, then you are, you know, then you are able to go to heaven or, you know, hell, depending on if, you know, whether or not you want to go with that. Basically, along the lines, they believe that love is love. Along with the lines with the, you know, the LGBT, I refer to them as alphabet animals, but um, they believe, you know, love is love. If you saw it today, this actually just came out today. The Pope came out and said that everybody that's in the LGBT, I forgot all the letters after that, because they've added more. That's why I call them, you know, alphabet. Um, the Pope says that, you know, basically anybody a part of that group is, should be welcome in every single church and that it's, not a, uh, that it's not a crime, it's just a sin. And mind you that they don't necessarily read their Bible. My mom, she, you know, like I remember her reading it about once or twice when I was, uh, as I was growing up. Um, but honestly, I never read it. Uh, growing up, I never read it when I was going to the Catholic Church at all. The only times I ever read it is like if so, you know if somebody came up and said, "Hey, read this prayer," and it was like the Lord's Prayer, and that would be about as far as I went into the Bible. They don't you know read their Bible, so because the traditions and the ordinances and all that are above, they'll say no, it's on the same level, but they'll say no because you know what the church was there first. You know, man and the church were there first, and then we help. And then they say, when I say we, they mean like man helped put the scripture together. So that's why the Pope, whatever he says or your priest says, goes over what God's word says. 
when I talk to you about uh, it's actually the vicar of Christ. The vicar of Christ, the, the original notation of a vicar is an earthly representative of Christ. They believe that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, that he is, God, you know, that he is Jesus on earth. They used to, I don't know if they really teach indulgences all, you know, that much anymore. I think they teach that more in other countries than they do here. And an indulgence is basically, you know, like if God gets me five bucks, that's like, you know, a couple of days out of purgatory. So if Doc's going to go like pray for himself or pray for a loved one, you know, you go up and you give them however much and they'll say, okay, well, you just knocked this many days off of your Aunt Edna so she doesn't have to spend that much time in purgatory. They did a lot of this, you know, during, uh, like I say, the Middle Ages and all that kind of stuff because the Catholic Church was actually sinking and they, well, hey, this is a way to raise money. Nice way to, you know, for a fundraiser, right? Now let's look, well, here's the other thing. They will, you know, they will sit there and they will talk about the fact that, you know what, oh, actually, you know what, Tim, if you could play that video, because this is, remember how last week I played the video of the Pope talking about that, you know, there are many ways to heaven, right, that we all call them by different names and everything else. This is not a new idea. There's actually someone that's very popular that most people, you know, say, hey, he's a believer that actually teaches that as well. Tell me, what do you think is the future of Christianity? I think everybody that, that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people for, out of the, the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. Uh, they are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but uh, they know in their heart that they need something that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have, and I think that they are saved and that they're going to be with us in heaven. This is fantastic. And I'm so thrilled to hear you say that. There is a wideness in God's mercy. There is. There definitely is. So you see that Billy Graham and both, I think that's Robert Schuller, both of them are sitting there saying that it doesn't matter, that, that you don't even have to know the name of Jesus. But as I remember in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says this, it says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is, there is none other name under heaven given, by, uh, given among men whereby we must be saved. We cannot be saved by some other name. We cannot be saved by some other God. We cannot be saved by, you know, just because, hey, we want to say, hey, you know what? You know, I know that you want to believe. It, it's the ultimate cop-out. That's what it is. You have him. You have like people like Joel Osteen. You have all these different ones that will teach the exact same thing as what Billy Graham just taught. And Robert, Robert Schuller. He says, there was another time where he was on Larry King Live. He says, you know what? It's not really for me to judge. He says, but I believe that all Muslims will be there. All Hindus will be there. All Buddhists will be there. Because you know what? It's just their revelation of God that they had received. What does the Bible say? It says, you can't get saved unless, you know, it's by Jesus. What does it say, you know, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes into the Father except through me? Oh, no, and Buddha, and Confucius, and all these, you know, Hare Krishna. All these different ones? No. The Bible says there's no other name, right? There's no other name. And you have these ones out there, and they just sit there, and they, they make up stuff. And I've, I've said it before, and I've had people, like, get mad at me because of the fact they say, well, what are you talking about, that you don't think that Billy Graham was saved? I don't think he was. You say, well, how is that? He led all these other people, you know, to the Lord. If he's preaching that gospel, no, he's not. He's a false prophet then. We got to know him by their fruit, right? Let's look over at uh, 1, Timothy chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. For one, this is another area, you know, where they... Uh, where they talk about, you know, the fact of that you're about priests or a pastor of a church, all right? And so when we look at this, you know, terms, elder, pastor, those are all synonymous. They're all the same, you know, it's all speaking to the same person, you know, the same person, the, the one that's the head of the church, right? So First uh, Timothy chapter uh, 3, verse 2 says, a bishop, so a pastor, then must be blameless, 
the husband of one wife. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given uh, to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no, uh, no striker, not uh, greedy, of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not uh, covetous. One that, uh, one that ruleth well his own house, having children and subjects with all gravity. And I'm just going to you know, stop it right there. The fact is, is that that part where it says what? It says the husband of one wife. Most of, you know, all the priests are told that you are somehow more spiritual, you are somehow more holy because you are celibate, because you are single. That's what they teach. They say, you know what, you're holier because, you know what, you didn't get married. What does the Bible tell you? The Bible says, you know, to do what? It says that, you know, man, you know, was lonely, right? And so God created woman, right? God's word says that, you know, that men and women are to be together, right? And so it says, if you have a, you know, it says if you have a desire, uh, you know, of the office of a bishop, he, uh, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband or wife, vigilant, sober, of good be- of behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Now, right there, like I said, it's the fact that the Roman Catholic Church teaches the exact opposite of that—that that they are to remain unmarried or celibate. That's another area that they are, you know, way off on. Here's another one. Going back to Buddhism, and this is kind of funny how it is, is, is there was a saint called uh, Saint uh, Jos- Josaphat who was in fact, I'm going to mess up this name, uh, Siddhar- uh, Siddhartha Gautama. You know who that is? They thought this was a great, wonderful story. This was a story of a saint that went around. He was very giving. He did all these wonderful things. And they said, oh, this is a very nice man. This is a very good saint of God. And they sainted him. Do you know who the saint is? Buddha. Because the, uh, you know, the, the fact is, is that little did they know about that story was that Saint Jehoshaphat was actually, in fact, Buddha, the founder of Buddhism. They need to check out their sources first, don't they? But according to... Uh, according to you know Catholicism, Buddha is actually a Catholic saint. Here's another one: a Tibetan Lama, which is you know known you know for like in Buddhism and all that. Listen respectfully to a Jesuit priest. They were sitting there going over and they were talking about you know conversing, saying, "Hey, you know, is your religion the same as my religion? Are we? Oh, how's it different?" Going back and forth, and this and this Lama you know replied back to the priest and said, "Your religion is the same as ours." So there's a lot of things that we begin to see and begin to know is the fact that even the fact of communion. I talked about last week a little bit about you know, transubstantiation, the thought that the, the, the bread and the wine, which part of that you know, part about being a, you know, a bishop, was you're not supposed to be given to wine. But they take it you know, when they have communion. Is the fact that um, they believe that that, uh, that bread and that uh, body actually turn into the literal flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. That's what they call transubstantiation, that instantly it, like, it transforms and that you're actually eating, you know, you're actually eating the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, actually, where this comes from, it actually parallels a pre-Christian Greco Roman and European ritual that involved eating the body and the blood of a god. So they're bringing in, it's not only, you know, they're trying to bring Christianity in, but they're also, you know, you know, mixing it with all these different pagan religions. And we'll actually be able to see this here in a little bit is the fact of how much did they actually do. That uh, what ended up happening was is that Constantine, because everybody's like, oh, Constantine, he brought Christianity along. No, he didn't. He didn't want to go against everybody else. He, he thought Christianity would bring his kingdom together. And so what he did was he, he declared that Christianity was the religion of, you know, of the nation, right, or of his empire. But he didn't want to go against everybody, so what he did was he, he took their gods from other religions and made them into those rituals or those gods. Or the fact that, you know, what he also did was he took, um, he, didn't, he didn't want to leave all of his idolatrous, you know, ways, his, all of his pagan, you know, practices, you know, ways, so he brought them in. And so it's no longer Christianity, you know, what you have is, is basically the fact you know, is, is that you have a whole bunch of what? Pagan religions come together in all in one thing. And actually, there are a number of holidays and, you know, that were started off as Catholic holidays, and obviously we've Christianized them and you know, whatever, but were actually, uh, they were fertility festivals. 
before Christianity, you know, the Catholic Church came along and, you know, it was, not, sorry, Catholic and Christianity, Catholics started way down the line, actually. They always say that it came at, you know, at 30 AD, right, when Peter and all them, that that's when, you know, that's when Catholicism started. But you could actually find out that it actually started around 325 AD. That that's when it actually started. It didn't start all the way back like they say. That it didn't start with, the, you know, with, with uh, Peter the Apostle. But anyways, they, uh, they, they took these holidays, and th- these were fertility uh, ho- uh, festivals. And I don't want to necessarily say what they are, but I'm going to say what they are because you're like, well, I'm not going to ever celebrate these holidays ever again. Christmas? Easter? Last one, you better not be you know, celebrating Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras. They were all, those were all fertility festivals that were going on, and then the Catholic Church says, well, you know what, we'll just kind of add something on top of that because we want to appease everybody. We want to go on top of it. Obviously, you know, uh, you know, Christmas, we're not going around, you know, celebrating fertility gods. Not, you know, we, we just said, you know what, I mean, and they've gone back, you know, some scholars said they've gone back and they figured that Christ was maybe born somewhere in the spring or in the summer. You know, it's not a matter of when you're, you know, celebrating. It's the fact that, you're, you know, you're celebrating Jesus Christ, right? The same thing with Easter, you know. It's probably around that time that they think, you know, because, that, you know, Passover is obviously a little bit easier to figure out with the Jew, uh, Jewish calendar. We don't necessarily know the exact date as far as when Jesus was born. But the thing is, is that that's where, you know, the, a lot of this stuff comes from. And the Catholic practice, practice of praying to the saints, or praying to saints, has been called, basically, I mean, it's, should call it what it is, it's idolatry. And it's, you know, and it's the fact of it's a relic of goddess worship. When uh, people you know, back in the day would, um, when they would do it, because obviously if you go to a lot of Catholics' homes, if they're a devout Catholic, they will have pictures, they will have statues, they will have all that in their house. Well, you can't, you know, say that's not you know, idolatrous. Oh, no, we're just praying through them. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Here's the part, uh, the Roman Catholic Church emphasizes the Mass, but you know what the uh, you know what mass actually is? They say they're going to mass. It is which they see as an act of re-sacrificing the actual body and blood of Christ by a priest. So every time you go to you know mass, they're re-sacrificing them. They're saying you know what we got to re-sacrifice Jesus over and over and over and over again. The last time I you know read the Bible in Hebrews, it says that Jesus was sacrificed once and for all. You don't have to do it every single week. And so, when we look at this, it's just the fact of, like I say, over and over again, you see these things that keep going on. Like I said before, and I'll, you know, I'll bring this up, is, is that Constantine, like I said, he, legal, he quote-unquote legalized Christianity because he wanted to bring the kingdoms together, right? He called for a council in 325 A.D., the Council of Nicaea, in an attempt to unify Christianity. Constantine envisioned Christianity as the religion that, would, that could unite the Roman Empire, uh, which at that time was beginning to fragment and divide. While this may have uh, seemed to be, a, to be po- a positive development for the Christian church, the results were anything but positive, just as Constantine refused to fully embrace the Christian faith, but continued many of his pagan beliefs and practices, so the Christian church that Constantine promoted were a mixture of true Christianity and also Roman paganism. So, like I said, he brings all this stuff together. One of the ones that he brought in there was, you know, he he brought in the cult of Isis. There was a religion of Isis. It was a cult. Who's Isis? That was the Egyptian mother goddess religion. And so that was absorbed into Christianity. Like I said, remember, he'll take certain parts of it and then you know, re- rename it. So Isis was a mother goddess, right, of that religion? He comes and he, re- he replaces Isis with Mary. You know why? Because you, you remember last week I said, you know, said that Mary is known as the queen of heaven? Isis is the queen of, uh, is the queen of heaven. And so you see all these things beginning to correlate. The queen of heaven, they're talking about, you know, you know, that Mary is the queen of heaven. No, who they're talking about is Isis, this false god. They're switching out names. All they're doing, it's a, it's a pagan religion, and they're just going, you know what, we'll put some Christian you know, stamp on it, and it'll be all right. The Catholic Church is actually what also brought to popularize and Christianize 
Halloween. And people are like, what? I like going out and getting candy. I just told my daughter, I said, you know, wait, you know, wait, like, you know what, we'll buy, a, you know, a bag of candy later on. I don't even want to buy the candy that they, you know, that's even Halloween or whatever because it's just nasty. But you also hear, like, all the different horror stories about different things. I mean, my brother one time went out for, uh, one time when we were kids, went to go uh, trick-or-treating, and he bit into uh, some candy, and there was a needle in it. But the Catholic Church is the one who kind of Christianized it because they're like, oh, no, this is not a, a thing of the Druids. What this is is All Saints Day. Oh, sorry, All Hallows Eve, and the next day is All Saints Day. And so they try to, like, put a different name on it so that way it's not Druid worship. It's not, you know, worshiping the pagan gods of the Druids. No, it's, you know what, it's, the, it's for the saints. It's for the saints. So Mary, so Mary, according to the, you know, uh, according to Isis, like I said, she was, uh, she's no. These are all names that they use for Isis that they also use for Mary, which is Mother of God, God Bearer, and Queen of Heaven, and they are all. All these things are attached to Mary. The whole uh, the whole big part about this is is that the temples of uh, the temples to Isis were in fact converted into temples dedicated to Mary. So they even had that at that moment when all those people were going around and they were worshiping Isis. They just said, you know what, we're going to legalize Christianity. We're going to make this a temple unto Mary. So they try to Christianize all these things, but they're not. They're, all they're doing is, is they're making it more of a bigger pagan religion, right? And where this all happened was in Alexandria, in e Alexandria Egypt, which was the focal point of Isis worship. They that's where they, you know, that's where they work or worship this, this, uh, this false, uh, this false woman, uh, prophet. There's one. Uh, it's called uh, Methorism. It was a religion in the uh, Roman Empire in the first through fifth centuries A.D. It was a very popular among the Romans, especially among Roman soldiers, and was pro uh, possibly the religion of several Roman emperors. While uh, Methorism was never uh, given official status in the Roman Empire, it was the de facto uh, official religion until Constantine and succeeding Roman emperors uh, replaced uh, Matherism with Christianity. One of the key features of Matherism was a sacrificial meal, which was uh, involved eating the flesh and drinking the blood of a bull. That was their whole thing, you know, about transubstantiation and all that. That's where they, you know, kind of get this of a bull, of a god. You know, Matheris, uh was the god, he was the god of this religion, you know, and they talked about drinking flesh and blood, like actual real flesh and blood, not just like, oh, it was transforming, but it was actually, you know, what other religion that I, there's no religion, and you can, you know, some people say well, it's not, but it is, is this, Satanism does the same thing. Satanism does the same thing. They actually go out, they have the flesh, and what they do, which is even more sadistic, is the fact that they will actually go find, you know, a virgin. They'll take that flesh, either the virgin or they'll take a baby, whatever they can find, and they will take that flesh, and then they will take that blood, and then they will all come together and they will have communion. And the Catholics are teaching all this, you know, same stuff, the same horrible stuff. Most of the uh, Roman emperors and citizens were honotheist. A honotheist is one who uh, believes in the existence of many gods, but focuses primarily on one particular god or uh, considers one particular god supreme over all the other gods. For example, the Roman god Jupiter, this is how we got all of our planets' names, by the way, is by Roman you know, gods, was supreme over the Roman pantheon of gods. Roman sailors were often uh, worshippers of Neptune, the God of the oceans. When the Catholic Church absorbed Roman paganism, it replaced the pantheon of gods with the saints. Just as the Roman pantheon of gods had a God of love, a God of peace, a God of war, a God of uh, strength, a God of wisdom, etc., so the Catholic Church had the saint who was in charge over each of these. And in many other categories, just as many Roman cities had a God specific to the city, so the Catholic Church provided patron saints for the cities. All they're, like I said, all they're doing over and over again is doing what? They're taking all these pagan things, all these false religions, 
and they're trying to make it look like it's Christian. That's all they're doing over and over again. As far as in, you know, the Hindu gods, I could, uh, you know, there's a, I, it's, it's a lengthy article here actually, but I'm not going to go over all of it. But the fact is, is that they have in uh, Buddha, in Buddhism, or sorry, in Hinduism, they actually have a trinity. It's called Brahma, uh, Vishnu, and Shiva, which is represented oftentimes by the image of one body with three heads. And so what they'll do is they'll take this part and they will, you know, uh, in there they actually have a whole story about the fact that, um, that what was it, Venshu, his mother was to be a virgin that was named uh, Maya, conceived him by a ray of light. His birth was foretold by a miraculous dream. And when uh, he was born, a marvelous light shone all around. A holy hermit, never heard of a holy hermit, in a far off uh, forest received supernatural information that uh, Venshu had just become incarnated in a human form. So remember, obviously, Hinduism, you know, the fact that their whole thing is is that eventually they hit nirvana, they want to hear nirvana, they're hoping that, that, you know, when they're here that, you know, when they die, they've done, done enough good things so they can go on to nirvana. But if they don't, they come back as some other creature, like a bug, like a fly. They're reincarnated back because, you know what, they didn't do, uh, they didn't do anything right. So next time you swat a fly, you better watch out. That could be Uncle Frank. But they take all these different things and they'll talk about, you know, the fact that... that um, that uh, in these in these books they'll follow this whole thing, and, and the strange part is is how close this comes to, uh, to Catholicism. Because the thing is, is that along with this, they will say that you know what, every sin must be atoned for, and where everybody be like, oh yeah, amen, yeah, every sin must be atoned for. Well, our atonement comes through, uh, through Jesus Christ. But what they say, you know, needs to happen is that they need to stay away, that they need to deny themselves worldly pleasures, and undergo severe penances that they might um, be able to be okay. When I say you know, penances, they will go around and beat themselves. They will go around and they will actually like whip themselves. And there's been, either, if you go online, you could probably you know, find out, like just type in probably like Catholics Philippines or Catholics in you know, Mexico or whatever. They will actually go in these other countries where you know, there's a big Catholic comp- uh, po- uh, population is that they will go and they will like beat themselves until they're bloody on their back. They'll actually even take whips where they're actually like ripping off flesh and everything else because that's what they have to do for, you know, for sin. Hinduism does the same exact thing. And that was one of the reasons why I actually last week I brought up the point about you know, the fact of like manuscripts and everything else because some people are like, well, why are you bring up you know, Bible manuscripts? That's kind of boring. I don't want to hear it. Because those manuscripts you know, that they do, what they do in some of these Bibles is that they will actually change that part where you know, the Apostle Paul says you know, that I, you know, I strive, I go towards the prize, right? They take that one and they change it and they say, I beat myself into submission. I beat my body to make it my slave. And so you don't think that, you know what, there's all these you know, different, you're like, oh no, if it doesn't say Catholic edition, it's not the same. Like I said last week, there's two, that you're, there's two Catholic editions that have the same exact name as, you know, supposedly, you know, the, the Protestant side, which I believe, honestly, they're, they're the same. They just put a Catholic edition instead of leaving it off, which one was the ESV and the New Living uh, Translation. There's, they have Catholic editions of both, of them, and I'm, I'm, I haven't looked at them, but I can guarantee pretty much they're probably, they'll say the same exact thing. The only thing that may be different is they'll add those seven books that we talked about last week that they you know, put in there as well to make it Catholic. By the way, this article I'm reading, is, it's not you know, updated. It's from 1840, so nothing's really changed. Actually, 1870. They, will, uh, they refer to, um, these, uh, the Hindus also refer to um, uh, Venshu as the Lord of the earth, dispenser of grace, all these different names, the savior of the world. I mean, all these, you know, uh, really weird names. And the thing is, is that 
like I said, again, over and over again, it talks about the fact that they will go to like the forest and they will like do all these penances and all this other stuff. And also, just so you know, women were not allowed to devote themselves to the saintly life. Remember, Hindus and Buddhists and Catholics, they all have like monks and they all have uh, monasteries and they have all this. Women are not necessarily allowed to be, you know, godly like they are, like the men are. They're not allowed to go out and, and actually, uh, you know, do these things. Now, somebody asked me last week about the rosary. The rosary actually originates with Hindus. Or sorry, yeah, oh no, sorry, with Buddhists. Because they will go, uh, you know, the, the hermits and saints of, uh, in the community of saints in Buddhism who lived in the forest were accustomed to going through their ritual of praying many prayers by the help of strings of beads. Buddhists have retained this ancient habit. Pilgrims are uh, constantly met uh, on their way to uh, Bel- uh, Benares, repeating prayers insistently while they pass their fingers over the long string of beads, just as Catholic pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem or Rome may be seen performing their devotions by the help of what? Rosaries. So they're following, they're just bringing more in these pagan religions all, all in. They're like, hey, it works over there for them. Let's bring it on in. Just bring it on in. There was one part in here that I thought was extremely kind of funny, in a way, is the fact that if they have like this statue or this picture in their house set up, and they go there, and they're supposed to pray, and they say, you know what, you know, thank you that you're going to be, you know, that you're going to do this in my life, that, you know, they're going to be praying. If that doesn't happen, they can kind of come back and be like, it's all your fault. It's all your fault. You're the reason why it didn't happen. You know, and they start chastising their picture. I think ain't going to do jack squat for you. I'm just sorry. I mean, I just sit there and I go, okay, so you're blaming the statue, you're blaming the pitcher for the fact that you just wanted to sit there and ask a, pe- a pitcher or a, a statue to do something for you. And when it didn't do it, you got mad. Gee, I wonder, I mean, the Bible says that, you know what, you, you ask statues that have no ears that they can't hear and they have no eyes that they can't see and they have no mouth that they can speak. It is just absolutely crazy to me. It just, it blows my mind, you know, all these things. And then there's also, uh, you know, you guys ever heard of the, the you know, there's a, a small image, it's of a lamb. Do you know what that small image of the lamb is, you know, the one that has, you know, it's, it's a lamb with a halo around it, or a halo around his head? Or the fact of the, uh, the lamb that's ready to be sacrificed is bound, you know, hand and feet, or... It's supposed to be, but it's actually a Catholic thing. You know, it's actually, uh, and it's called Agnes Day. And what that's supposed to do is, is this, it's supposed to be worn. It's, it's uh, sorry, it was, it was worn almost universally uh, by the peasantry of Catholic countries who had, un, who have undoubtedly, or uh, undoubting faith that the consecrating ceremonies performed over it by the priest have rendered it a, a sure protection against evil spirits. Like I said, they will take all these different relics and everything else on there, and they will sit there and they will say, you know what, this is going to protect you from evil. This is going to protect you from evil. This is going to protect you from evil. Oh, here, I found it. In this, in this portion, you know, the, I'm just going to read this you know, out of here because it is, it is hilarious how, they, how they, uh, they put this in here in this article. It says this. It says, every Buddhist house contains the image of, of some saint to whom... The, uh, the inmates or the, the people that are inside the house pray for abundant uh, harvest, healthy children, prosperous journeys, and, and such other blessings as they may desire. If they fail to receive what they pray for, they sometimes beat the poor images and call them ugly names. The people, people of Catholic countries make similar intercessions to the images and the pictures of the saints, which they uh, keep in their dwellings. And if their prayers prove fruitless, they often take the, uh, turn the picture of the saint to the wall or strike the image saying, you ungrateful, good for nothing. Saying, uh, every day I have brought you prayers and offerings and not a thing have you done for me. Well, what would you expect the picture to do? Talk to you? What kind of drugs are you on that you want this thing to actually you know, like respond to your prayer? It's not going to do anything because we know that God, the only God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Lord of lords is the only one that can answer our prayers. Amen? Amen. And the thing is, is that you, you see this both you know, on here with the Buddhists and the Catholics, that they're believing the same thing. 
Like I said, the one guy said, you know what? We believe the exact same thing. He was a Buddhist monk talking to a priest, and they're going, hey, we believe the exact same thing. There's a, uh, they just keep on mixing over and over again these, uh, these religions over and over again. In every uh, Chinese house, there is an altar covered with inscriptions. Uh, Chinese are often uh, Buddhists. Um, with inscriptions and images of the saints, before uh, which the members of the family kneel and say uh, prayers, as Catholics do before the image, usually set up in some sort of uh, dwelling. The most common image of uh, Chinese household altars is that, uh, uh, is that of Xing Mu, which means mother goddess. It represents a, a woman with a glory round, uh, round her head and a babe in her arms. The tradition is that she was a virgin who conceived by uh, contact with a water lily and gave birth to a wonderful child who became a holy man and performed great miracles. Does this sound really, really familiar? And the Catholics will do the exact same thing. It says, if the Chinese were to visit the churches and the chapels of Catholic Europe and see the, the numerous images of the Virgin Mary spangled the spangled garments of blue and crimson with a gilded halo around, around her head and that, and that of the infant Jesus uh, she carries in her arm, they might easily mistake, uh, mistake the representations for their uh, Xing Mu. It is said that the holy images in Buddhist countries sometimes raise uh, their eyelids and nod their heads in response to prayer. And even within a few years, we have heard of similar miracles performed by the images of Mary. So they'll sit there and they just bring all this stuff out there. Then they talk about the fact of them that they will go to certain, that Buddhists will go to certain places for water that's supposed to be considered to be more holy than the other, you know, than the other water. Catholics go to the Jordan, the River Jordan. Maybe that's why, you know, sometimes they see the pictures of the River Jordan and there's like no water in there. Maybe they got a whole bunch of Catholic priests out there and all of a sudden they, they took all the water. I don't know. All right, I'm done with that. Having fun yet? All right. You know the you know the Madonna and, the, and Child, not the singer Madonna, but the Madonna and Child that they often show, which is supposed to be Mary and Jesus, you know, together. They can actually uh, bring that. They actually bring back that story all the way back to Babylon. They say that's actually the st that story that they will do. The Roman Catholic tradition is is that story actually starts. You know, is a story of Nimrod, uh, Ceramus, and the baby uh, Tammuz. Until the age of thirty, um, sorry, this was somebody else. You know, that wrote this on there. But they talk about the fact of the the Queen of Heaven as well. But in here is the fact that the Queen of Heaven. If you actually look at it uh, in the Bible, the Bible actually, you know, considers that to be a, a pagan a, a abomination that actually angers and provokes the Lord to anger. If you look up Queen of Heaven in the Bible, every time that is brought up, it's not because it's Mary. It's because it's a pagan god. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 18 says this. It says, the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the woman knead their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. God ain't happy with the queen, uh, the, you know, the queen of heaven. And sometimes, you know, you'll have people say, you know, uh, that they don't worship Mary, that they don't worship these people, they don't, because, uh, you know, I used to say, I would say it to them, I said, you worship Mary, you worship Paul, you worship all these ones. And they'll say, no, we simply venerate her out of respect. But you tell me whether or not they worship her. Here's a prayer that they will pray. O mother of perpetual help, grant me ever to be uh, able to call upon thy powerful name, since thy name is the help of the living and the salvation of the dying. So all of a sudden she becomes, she's like salvation. Why do you need Jesus, right? She's, she offers salvation, right? Ah, Mary, most pure Mary, most sweet, grant that thy name from this day forth may be uh, to me the very breath of life. Dear lady, now, so now she all of a sudden is becoming the breath of life. She's, she's giving life to people. Dear lady, delay not to come to, uh, to my assistance whenever I call upon thee. For in all the temptations that assail me and all, uh, all the necessities that befall me, I will never leave off uh, calling upon thee, ever repeating, Mary, Mary. What a comfort, what a sweetness. 
What, a, uh, what confidence, what tenderness fills my, my soul at the sound of thy name, at the very thought of thee. I give thanks to, uh, to our Lord, who for my sake hath uh, given thee a, a name so sweet, so lovable, so mighty, but that I am not content to merely speak thy name. I would, I would utter it for, every, uh, for very uh, love of thee. It is my desire that love should ever remind me to name thee, Mary of perpetual help. So would you say in that entire prayer that, that you think that, you know, that they're just venerating her? They're just out of respect. No, they're worshiping her. You know, I mean, they're, they're flat out worshiping her. You know, they're saying that she brings comfort, she brings peace. The only time they talk about Jesus is the fact that, you know, you know thank you for giving us her. That's it. It says, I give thanks to our Lord for who, uh, for I'm sorry, who for my sake hath given a name so sweet? Jesus is not even mentioned. They just say, Lord, that's it. In the book, Babylon, Mystery of Religion, an author, Rudolph Woodrow, shows us where the Catholic uh, where the Roman Catholic mother and child worship come from. Nimrod, the mighty hunter, before or against the Lord, was the first to organize cities uh, into a kingdom under a human rule in Genesis chapter 10. This much, this much we know from the, the, the Bible. The name Nimrod comes from the word he rebelled. It has that, uh, that Nimrod married his own mother, Semiramis. After uh, Nimrod died, Semiramis claimed Nimrod was the sun god. She, came, uh, she later had a child, uh, Tammuz, uh, whom she claimed was, uh, was Nimrod reborn, supernaturally conceived the promised seed, the savior. Semiramis uh, developed a religion of mother and child worship. Symbols were uh, used to develop a mystery religion. Since Nimrod was believed to be the sun god, Baal, so anytime you see the word Baal or Bel Beelzebub or any of those kind of names in the Bible, it's all Baal. You can call you know, they even call them Balaam, they call them all, all these different ones. If it has Baal in there, that, that's what they're talking about, the sun god. It, all they do is change names. Even in the Bible, obviously, like I said, you know, you'll see that name in the Bible, Baal, and it's all throughout the Bible. I even saw, you know, in places where they're actually saying we need to bring back Baal worship, not even trying to hide it. Since Nimrod was believed to be a sun god, you know, uh, Baal, fire was considered to his earthly representation. In other forms, Nimrod was symbolized by sun images, fish, trees, uh, pillars, and animals. Tammuz, the son of the sun god, was represented by the golden calf. And so it was that mankind followed this religion of worshiping the creation rather than the creator. As we see in Romans chapter 1, it talks about that they worshiped the creator or sorry, they worship the, the, uh, the cre uh, creature rather than the creator. A few more minutes and then we'll, if you have any questions. But many pagan religions have mother and child worship. Devinki and Krishna is India. Isis and Horus is Egypt. Venus or Farina and Jupiter is Rome. Each nation gave different names to the, essentially the same god or goddess. A mother goddess or a queen of heaven was said to have given miraculous birth to a son. Ancient uh, Israel sometimes followed this false religion. And there's a bunch, I'll give you the, uh, the, the names, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll give you, uh, you, know, you know, where you can find them and look them up. But every single time, God is not happy. Judges chapter 2, verse 13. Judges chapter 10, verse 6, 1 Samuel 7, uh, chapter 7, verses 3 and 4, 1 Samuel 12, 10, 1 Kings 11, 5, 2 Kings 23, 13, Jeremiah 44, 17 through 19. And if you want those, you can, afterwards, I'll, yeah, I can give them to you. But every single time, and the thing is, is that in, here's the thing, we just got done reading, you know, going through Ephesus, uh, you know, through Ephesians, Right? In Ephesus, Semiramis was worshipped as the great, uh, the great mother, Diana. So when you see, you know, great, great as Diana, great as Artemis, great as, all those ones are the same ones for Baal. All these ones. 
Here's the, here's the funny thing. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia about the Virgin Mary admits that in the first centuries A.D. that there are no traces of the worship of Mary. There are no, uh, there are no places at, at all. Before the fourth century, the time of, the, uh, of Emperor uh, Constantine, worshiping Mary as a goddess and offering cakes to her at her shrine became, uh, or sorry, began to come into uh, the professing church. In AD 4, uh, 430, the Council of Ephesus made Mary worship official by mixing beliefs already being practiced. Diana of Ephesus worshiped as a goddess with nominal Christianity. So-called church fathers reasoned that they could gain more followers or you know, gain more converts. It is the same old story, and the you know over and over and over again. You see these things over and over again. Does anyone have any questions? I don't know what uh, what God that they're following, but it's basically just another God that they say that you're now over this you know this city or this you're over uh, you know healing or you're over you know because they'll, they'll you know it's not just over a city, but they'll also say that you are the, not you know they're basically sorry you're not a God over it you're only a saint over, but you know you can provide protection to this city or you can you know protection healing whatever you have to go to different saints. I'm not really sure where Christopher comes in. You know, the funny thing is, is that, you know, you have all these different ones that some of them were not even Catholic, that they actually even have made saints. St. Patrick was not Catholic. They made him one, but he's not. St. Patrick, you know, or just Patrick, you know, went around showing people the three-leaf clover and explaining to them the Trinity and trying to get people saved. Catholics will kind of like grab on whoever, you know, is good at the moment. Kind of like the fact that they sainted, you know, Buddha. I mean, and they think that if you've done so much good work and miracles and all that kind of stuff. Am I right, Doug? He's my, he's my other resident, uh, you know, Catholic, you know, that, or former Catholic. Yeah, I don't remember either. That's, it's been about... Uh, a good uh, 30, you know, 35 years or so. And I told that to Doug, and he goes, I, he goes, I think I might got you beat. And he, he had a couple more years on me. Yeah. <laughs> I said a couple. I wasn't going to tell. But uh, any other ones? Any other questions? Does it sound kind of crazy to you? Or all this stuff? And then it, does it also begin, you know, begin to make sense why you see all these different practices happening in the church or in the Roman Catholic Church? It's because they're not obviously going with you know, uh, Christianity. They're going you know, with Christianity and other pagan religions and just bringing them all together. It's like just a hodgepodge of whatever they wanted to bring in. And they even say that, you know, obviously it says in the Catholic encyclopedia that they did it, that they you know, put Mary at, the, at that level because they figured that it, what? it would bring more converts. And that's in the Catholic Encyclopedia. They ain't lying about it. You just got to read it, I guess. And I don't really have time to be reading the Catholic Encyclopedia. But want me to keep going? Or you anybody got some questions? You have any, uh, Miss Jackie? You have any questions? I know that you say you have a friend of yours. Yeah.
That's good. Like I say, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of things, and you know what you can see, obviously, in that uh, situation is the fact that they have who are they replaced? They replaced Jesus with Mary. They're saying that Mary was crucified. They're saying Mary was, you know, uh, took that cross. That Mary took the punishment. Mary did. Mary, Mary didn't do anything. 